No? That's good. So, this evening I was going to talk about uh, some favorite verses of mine from the Dhammapada. Do people know what the Dhammapada is? This is a, a collection of verses by the, the Buddha. Uh, he spoke on lots of different occasions. And uh, um, yeah, Dhammapada is a very, very famous collection of these verses. And they're, they're very inspirational. And uh, people, they're actually one of the most, probably of all the Buddha's teachings, I would say it was the, the most loved, <laughs> actually, of the Buddha's teachings. So this one um, is, is, is something that I find very useful. With these teachings, with these verses, for instance, or even with questions, if they resonate with, with us, if they bring something up for us, if they make us investigate, look into things, they're very useful. And for me, this one is very useful. And uh, because it's focused on something that's very important at this time of the year, I think, is what really matters, what's really important uh, for us. Because too often, you know, we are taken up with our day-to-day -day life and we don't keep our mind, we don't uh, focus on what is really important for us. And if we don't have those sort of goals in mind, what's, what's, what's the most important thing for us? We tend to live our lives in a, a way that doesn't go towards what we want to attain, what we want to, the direction we wish to go in. So, I'll read these uh, uh, verses from the Dhammapada. I think many people will know this, or some of you will. <laughs> and so it goes, Those who regard what is not essential as essential, and what is essential as not essential, Dwelling in such fields of wrong thought, they never realize the essence. But those who know what is essential as essential and what is not essential as not essential, dwelling in such fields of right thought, they realize the essence. So... When I first uh, read that, I, 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 I had the impression of like a Zen teaching. Do people, do people find it a bit like a Zen teaching, that? What does the Buddha mean, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that if we regard what is not essential as essential and what is essential as not essential, what is he talking about? So this is a, for me, it, it brings up questions. And I think for each of us, it will bring up uh, different questions maybe of our priorities, what's important to us and uh, um, what's essential for us. Because often, you know, with life, as I was saying, we don't, we don't focus on what is essential and we don't focus on where it's taking us to, uh, as the Buddha is pointing out here, to the essence. The essence, of course, is the goal. The essential are the things that take us to that goal. And uh, one of the uh, stories that I like, and it's from Sri Lanka actually, uh, is uh, a story which points this out quite well, which is about priorities, about getting, uh, working out what is essential, what comes first. And people from Sri Lanka know this character very well. It's uh, Under, Andere. I think most people from Sri Lanka know Andere. Immediately they smile <laughs> because Andere was a... Uh, he was he's reputed to be, legend has it, that he was a court jester for the, uh, some of the kings of Sri Lanka who lived in Kandy. And he was supposed to have lived in, 17, in the 1700s. And he was the prankster, the uh, practical joker par excellence, you know, many funny stories. In fact, I, when I hear them, I think it's amazing he survived as a court jester. But in this story, one day Andre was... Uh, taking a shortcut, which is very common in Sri Lanka. <laughs> and uh, he's going through the paddy fields. And he saw these group of farmers, and they were all gathered around this huge rock. And he wondered what they were, you know, discussing, because they were deep in discussion about this huge rock. And he came closer, and they were talking about, oh, you know, it would be great to move this rock. There would be so much uh, more room in the paddy field. We'd be able to grow more rice. And then they were very concerned with where to move the rock. And uh, they were discussing, we can move it here, we can move it there. And then Andre said to them, well, I can help you with moving the rock. 
And they were overjoyed. They thought, this is marvelous. And so they, uh, they said to Andre, well, what do you want? You know, to what, what, what would you need uh, to help move this rock? And he said, well, for three months, I would like the best rice, I'd like the best chicken, and all this choice food. Presumably, I think, so he's supposed to build up his strength to move this big rock. And they thought, wow, this is really a good deal. He'll move this rock, we'll be able to grow more rice, you know, and it would be great, and he can move it to where we want it. And so they were very, very pleased, and they gave him the food as, as required. Every day they bought this choice food, and every day Andre enjoyed it and so on. And then the day came for that he was to help move the rock. And so uh, Andre prepared, he put some padding on his shoulder, ready to go to the paddy field. He came to the field and all the farmers, the rice farmers, gathered around the rock, looking expectantly at the rock, looking at Andre, Andre uh, looking at them. And then he, he uh, uh, knelt down on one, one knee and put his shoulder towards the rock and he said to them, gentlemen, please lift so I can move the rock. <laughs> and immediately they realised they'd been fooled. There was no way they could lift the rock. And they had forgotten the most essential thing. How are we going to lift the rock? They had forgotten that this is what we need to do, not where we want to put it, you know, but how are we going to lift it? And Andre had, as usual, won the day with his, uh, with his wit, with his practical jokes. And he'd also <laughs> enjoyed quite, quite a nice meal for... Uh, Three months in very nice food. So, what what was the Buddha thinking of when he was saying, uh, "Those who regard what is not essential as essential"? And uh, usually, what the Buddha was talking about as not essential are the things that we we take up very seriously that really run this world, that turn this world around. They turn us around, the Buddha said, and they turn the world around. And I'm not talking about money, because usually we have that saying, don't we? Money turns, makes the world turn around. Or sometimes people say love makes the world turn around. That's another one. But the Buddha said what makes the world turn around are the worldly conditions. There are eight of them. Or worldly winds. And they turn us around and they turn the world around. The world revolves around them. So these worldly winds are the things that we're often preoccupied with. But do they really lead to our happiness, our inner happiness, our um, sense of fulfilment and purpose, meaning in life? And the first one of these that I was... I've changed the order, actually, from what they usually are because I think this is the order that, that really uh, people relate to most, actually. And the first one is looking for happiness through the senses. And this is a very big thing that... Uh, we as human beings, we know the senses. We know the, the pleasures of sight, sound, smells and tastes and touches. These are the things that we look for happiness in. And these are the things actually often they form uh, like addictions, don't they? We, we get very attached to them. And these days, you know, I... I oh my goodness, collapsed. <laughs> These days, these days, you know, for instance, the, the area of sights can be like travelling. People like to travel a lot. They like movies. They like paintings. They like... But one of the big areas these days is internet, isn't it? This is where people uh, are taken up, consumed, you know, looking for happiness and actually often finding a lot of suffering because... Uh, um, we, we hear quite a lot of about, don't we, on the internet, bullying and things like this. People, we, we don't only read and see the things we like, we also experience and see the things we don't like. And these worldly winds, these eight worldly dhammas, are all about desire and aversion, or desire and fear. So we desire the pleasant sights, of course, you know, to, uh, travel, as I said, nice, nice... Uh, um, movies and so on. We also go for very nice uh, sounds and music is an incredibly important thing these days, isn't it? It's really, it's really, it was when I was young, so I imagine it's even more so now. People uh, enjoy music, they live music. I see people when I go on walks, when I was in Melbourne recently going on walks, 
always jogging uh, with their iPods on, you know, always listening to, uh, I think, music. So it's, uh, it's something we, we, we try to find our happiness in. And it's the same with tastes. Food is very important for people. And you notice uh, people, uh, you know, have their favourite types of food and it means they get a lot of enjoyment from it. Um, and they uh, always, we're trying, when we, um, we enjoy these things, but we're always trying to avoid pain. There's pleasure. We're looking for pleasure through the senses, but we're trying to avoid pain. So often, you know, some of these, you see it, don't you? Some of these uh, pleasures, so-called pleasures, lead to addiction. Like even for eating, for instance, you know, people will binge, won't they? And then they have corresponding problems with their health, maybe overweight, obesity, these things. And it leads to pain. It actually goes to the opposite. And we're always trying to avoid pain. And in fact, a lot of the reasons, isn't it, that we are interested in these pleasures is to avoid pain. We're living, living our lives like we only want one side of the equation. And also we like um, smells. These are, these are things, perfumes, incense, uh, the smell of trees, flowers, gardens, all these things. And the same with touches with the body. This is very important for us. We, you know, as human beings, if you see our houses, if you see the places where we live, what are they geared to? Comfort. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of comfort that people are looking for in, in the world. And this is a form of happiness that uh, we, we're often seeking and trying to avoid the other side at all costs, pain. Uh, any, any sort of pain, physical pain or mental pain. And this reminds me, especially this search for you know, uh, pleasure through the senses, reminds me of a story of Nasruddin. Have you heard of Nasruddin? I think he's quite, quite famous. He's, I think again, almost like a literary character, but they say he was a real person. He was a Sufi uh, teacher, a Sufi mullah, they call him. And one day he was sitting with a huge pile of chilies and somebody, and his tears streaming down his face and he's eating chili after chili. And a friend came up to him and he said, Mullah Nasruddin, what are you doing? Why, why, why are you eating all these chilies? And you're streaming, it's obviously, you're not enjoying it. He said, I'm looking for the sweet one. <laughs> And that's what we do with a lot of our sense pleasures, actually. We're looking for the sweet one. And the interesting thing with sense pleasures is that, yes, there is happiness there. And often, you know, we try to repeat it and we don't get the same sort of happiness. So we have to spend a lot of time trying to, to, uh, f to actually get that sense pleasure. So this is uh, important, I think, number one for, for most people. This is one of the things that the Buddha pointed to as not being essential because what the Buddha is pointing to is the happiness of the mind, not the happiness of the body and the senses. And the other, the other worldly wins, and these ones, the next one I think we can relate to as well, is gaining, getting and gaining. This is the desire to, to get things, property, possessions, money, um, we see it in, in all aspects of our lives, actually, not only the material aspects. I call it shopping around. <laughs> we like to shop around a lot. And what are we looking for? We're always in this sort of uh, uh, worldly wind. We're always searching for the best, aren't we? We want the best, nothing less than the best. So the other areas that we find uh, we shop around are also for people, aren't we? We're trying to collect relationships, friendships, partners in our lives. And these are going to give us happiness. These are going to give us security. These are going to fulfill us. So we, that's another aspect. And you see this a lot in life, that uh, <laughs> we see all these dating services, online uh, services. And, and uh, I see it in Sri Lanka. They have, you know, they have, of course, the marriage columns and so on. You see that a lot. <laughs> They're not, not so much into online dating, I think. But this getting and gaining doesn't only apply to, uh, to the physical side, to relationships, to people. It also applies to spiritual life. Because you find this, uh, they call it spiritual materialism. 
People are shopping around for spiritual things. They'll try a bit of yoga, a bit of meditation, a bit of this and a bit of that. And they've heard of a new teacher who's come, you know, a Tibetan teacher, you know, read the latest book. So we shop around a lot, with, even with the spiritual side of life. And we think, by getting this, by gaining this, somehow we'll be happier, we'll be safer, we'll be more secure. And, but at the same time, what we do is we fuel that fear that we might lose all this. It might go, you know, the money, the possessions, uh, the people in our lives that are so important. We may lose them. And of course, that is, that is the essence of these worldly winds. Where there's pleasure, there is pain. Where there's gain, there will be loss. Has to be. But we, you know, we all want to just get gain. We all want to get pleasure. We don't want the rest. But if we can accept, if we can understand that this is part of life, then these worldly winds don't spin us around as much as they can. And the next one that the Buddha was talking about is uh, fame. I think most of us don't have to worry about fame too much. <laughs> We're probably not going to be so famous. So the internet is now making it possible for people who would never be famous, never be known of, to go, uh, I think they say viral. So you can see them on YouTube, you can, they're uh, on Twitter and things like this. But what fame is, uh, is concerned with, of course, is being known, is being somebody, is, is not, is, uh, is making one's mark in the world. And this is very important for, for, for us, actually, for our sense of identity, often this sense of our place in society. And uh, people, put a, we put a lot of emphasis on it. And this is a worldly wind that affects us, that drives us. So that is a very uh, um, strong, strong sort of wind that we can see, you know, there are certain, um, you know, professions... And, they're like, for instance, singers these days, aren't they? Very famous. Uh, some singers, not all. We think of David Bowie, who just passed away. And politicians, sports people these days, incredibly famous. We may not be like that, but we have similar concerns. And of course, the other thing we, with this concern about be making our mark, being somebody, being known, is the fear of rejection, of not, of not being ignored, for instance, of uh, these sort of negative things. And this, course, of course, comes with uh, wanting recognition, wanting to be appreciated, being approved. So this is another worldly win that the Buddha said is not essential. And it's also somewhere where we can see the sense of self very strongly. And... I can uh, maybe, yes, tell the story of the, uh, the story that goes with these verses is about the teacher of the two main disciples of the Buddha when they were first searching for the spiritual life and they met a teacher called Sanjaya and they became students of this teacher called Sanjaya and later they met a Buddhist monk who taught them what he knew of the Dhamma and both these two uh, chief disciples became achieved the first stage of enlightenment just hearing a few verses from this monk and they went they were full of you know um, a happiness a sense of having arrived at what they were searching for and they went to their teacher Sanjaya and told him and said please come with us we're going to the Buddha we're going to seek ordination with the Buddha and Sanjaya said it's not possible. It's not possible. It's like, he said, a big water pot becoming a cup. And then he said to them, who are more numerous in the world? Who are more, the foolish or the wise? And they said, well, foolish, actually. <laughs> and he said, well, the Buddha can teach the wise and I will teach the foolish. And so that was his attitude. And they, they left him and then he went and joined the Buddha. They ordained with the Buddha. So he was turning down an opportunity from the sense of fame. He was a famous teacher at that time. Now, nobody knows of him at all, <laughs> except through the Buddha's teachings. And uh, the, last, the last one of these worldly wins, and this is a very interesting one for all of us, is 
seeking praise and avoiding criticism or blame. And this is a great one for, uh, uh, for all of us because when we, uh, if you, it's particularly when we're uh, blamed or we're criticised, you really can see the sense of self come up. You know, you can feel really indignant. You can feel really upset. Often people say, when we talk in Buddhism about non-self, the first thing is to examine the concept, the, the illusion of self. This is a very good place somebody says to you, you're stupid or something, you <laughs> just see the reaction to that and see the sense of self come up. So it's a very useful thing to use in our practice, but most of us don't. We're just, we are just spun out by it. We're upset by it. We're annoyed by it. And sometimes we're blamed unfairly, sometimes quite fairly. <laughs> sometimes we're praised unfairly and sometimes we're praised fairly. So... These are areas that we can um, use for our practice, actually. And as I say, if we see them as just par for the course, part of life, then we don't get so upset with them. And now I'd just like to ask you for a moment to close your eyes and come into the present and just see what is essential in the present, what is important in the present. So do, do you notice anything that's quite important in the present that we don't usually pay attention to? Actually, only in meditation do you really notice it. Any suggestions? Silence. Silence, that's good. Good. Sorry? A line? The lightning of the Buddha. And I heard breath. That's actually, that's what I was thinking of. The most prominent things now in the present, present moment are the now and the breath. You might, some people might say the heartbeat. But, you know, we, we overlook these very much. You know, we don't pay much attention to them. But were we not to, say, for instance, breathe for a few, moment, few minutes, we would, if we didn't breathe in again for a few minutes, we would die. If we didn't breathe out for a few minutes, we would die. So this is actually one of the essentials of our lives that we don't pay any attention to. And it reminds me of um, the story of Nasruddin when he was cooking and he had uh, this piece of liver that he was going to cook and he was working out, he was, was about to cook it and this eagle flew down and grabbed the liver and flew off. And then Nasruddin yelled out to the eagle, You fool! I've still got the recipe! <laughs> now we're like that. <laughs> we, we're paying attention to other things rather than what, what is essential at the moment, the breath, uh, these things, the present moment. We're often living in the future. So that it's very useful to just to ground ourselves in what's actually important in the present moment. And, um, and I'd like to do another contemplation. This is the participation part of the evening, which is to close the eyes again. And this one may be more difficult for you, actually, more challenging. But it's a very good contemplation, is just to close our eyes and just to imagine that we've been to the doctors and the doctors told us that we have only got three days to live, only three days left. We're going to die in three days. What would be important for us? What would be essential?
So I wonder if uh, we have any, any, any responses. What would be important? Would the emails be important? <laughs> would the iPad be important? What's that? Be in the present moment. That, that's very, yes. Because actually when we have, when we know, for instance, we're going to die in three days, for instance, time becomes incredibly precious then. So the present moment, what we do with that three days, is very, very important. And uh, something we, we often do, we waste our time, you know, especially, especially on the internet, you can, time can disappear. So any other things that people would do, would find important? Yes. Sorry? To love. To love, that's, yes, very important. And the other one? I heard another one over there. Be positive. Yes. I think to love is very important because the people, our relationships, that's one thing that would jump out at us if we only had three days to live. To make sure, you know, to be with those people that are important in our lives. Very, very important essential and to be positive yes yes to to make the most of our time for sure sorry try <laughs> we all try to do try to make try to extend to six days <laughs> then the contemplation doesn't work as well but what also comes to mind of course is that we would try to complete or deal with unfinished business. This is part of love too, you know. Forgiving people, forgiving ourselves, forgiving other people. You know, resolving some of the issues that we've had with ourselves and other people. That would be important because we don't want to leave this life with, that, with unfinished business. And of course things that are very important to us, you know, we may have projects, we may have things that we, we do, we contribute to to maybe charities or work that we do that helps others. That sort of thing can be very important. Uh, things that we've written or painting or creative things may be very important at that time. And of course, these are things that give us meaning or purpose. And this is actually one of the most important areas for us. And this is an essential thing. And of course, part of that is a spiritual life, isn't it? You know, having a spiritual practice, whether it be Buddhism or another religion, something that takes us within, that we look within, um, that focuses with on inner happiness. And of course, the thing that comes to me too is that if we only had three days to to live, we would be thinking of our own good qualities. Um, it's quite a good contemplation, actually, I think, to think what you would like people to remember you by at your funeral. And usually these are the good qualities that we have, you know, maybe a kind person or a generous person, thoughtful person, compassionate person. These good qualities. When, when somebody dies, they hardly ever reflect on their, their uh, money or their property, <laughs> those things. Uh, they'll often reflect on contribution to community, yes, those sorts of, those sorts of things. So these good qualities are also something that would become important if we only had three days to live. And the other part of the equation, and what and the Buddha is talking about, what is the essential, what is the things that we see, uh, what is the essential things that we see as not essential? Any ideas? Well, the Buddha, of course, and this is actually what uh, led him to become a Buddha. Before he was a Buddha, he was a Buddha-to-be, we say a Bodhisattva. And uh, the most important things were seeing an old person, a sick person, and a dead person. And these are, are essentials of life, actually, that usually, as I say, we overlook quite, quite happily, actually, we ignore. We, we don't like to think about those things. But if it were not for those things, would there have been a Buddha? Would, would, we, uh, would we be sitting here? No. I mean, this is part of life, uh, birth, old age, sickness and death. And the Buddha, of course, the, in many people would think of it as the essence, but it isn't. 
he said it wasn't the essence. The essential teaching, what is the essential teaching the Buddha gave because of birth, old age, sickness and death? Any ideas? I think everybody must get it. <laughs> hmm? Impermanence, yes, anicca, and that's, that's very true. I was thinking of the Four Noble Truths. People heard of the Four Noble Truths? And the Four Noble Truths are that uh, there is suffering, there is a cause of uh, suffering, and there is an end to the cause of suffering, and there is a way to the ending of suffering. So these, these Four Noble Truths were the heart of, of the Buddha's teaching. And uh, they are useful in everyday life as well. People often say, how do we develop insight? I hear this quite often, actually. How do we develop insight? And of course, the answer is, we can use any of the Buddha's teachings to reflect on our own lives. Insight is about our experience, but seeing it through the, t the, uh, the Dhamma, we say. Seeing it through things that are truths, that are, that are uh, essentials. So we can use, for instance, the Four Noble Truths. And we can ask ourselves in daily life, and this is, it's, we can, can relate to it, I think I can relate to it, is when we're experiencing something difficult, you can ask yourself, is this suffering? Is this what I'm experiencing? Is it suffering? And just ask ourselves, what, what's the cause? What's the cause of this suffering? I won't give any answers. <laughs> and then, if we can let go of that cause, the ending of that cause. What's that like? What, what do we experience then? And of course, what we experience is a lot of peace, a lot of ease. And the last one uh, is, what is the way to, what way can we use to the ending of, of this suffering, to the ending of this cause of suffering? So this is a very useful thing in daily life as well, the Four Noble Truths. But as I said, it's, it's essential, but it's not the essence that the Buddha pointed to. But what is very essential to us, of course, is the fourth noble truth of the way to the end of suffering. If we didn't have that, if the Buddha never taught that, we wouldn't have a path. And the path is the most important part, the most important thing for us. It's a practical thing. The Buddha, of course, is not asking us to believe in the four noble truths. He's not asking us to believe in his enlightenment. He's asking us to practice, to try these things out and see for ourselves. Because the whole emphasis of Buddhism, the whole emphasis of the teaching, is seeing for ourselves, directly for ourselves. The Buddha's teaching, the Buddha's wisdom is his wisdom. It's not our wisdom. But we can make it our wisdom by training, by using it as our framework, as a reference and seeing what we experience. So the important parts of the, uh, the most essential, actually, of the Buddha's teachings is giving is a very important part, dana. This is giving to anybody, to all people. And this is an opening of the heart, reducing of selfishness, self-concern, and it's vital for... for uh, for the path. It's also a way of making good karma, we say, making good karma. And it brings happiness because when we give, generally we feel happy. And this is also very useful in the meditation as well. We can use that happiness in our meditation. And the next one is probably to me, and more and more as I, uh, <clears throat> the more years I spend in the robes, I see this is more important all the time actually, is our ethical conduct. The way we speak and the way we act. This is actually where the most important part of the path because it determines the happiness in this life. If we act badly by body or speech in this life, it has consequences. People don't like us. We may end up in jail <laughs> we may, or whatever. But also, if people believe in rebirth or if they have an understanding that there is rebirth, it affects what comes after this life. So it's a, it's a really essential part of the path. I think if people never meditated, if they never gave anything, as long as they had a good standard of ethical conduct by body and speech, that would be enough. But this world, if that happened, this world would be like paradise. If people kept 
The five precepts, have people heard of the five precepts? These are the essential precepts that the Buddha uh, suggested. These are training rules that we take on voluntarily. They're not something the Buddha said, thou shalt do this, this, that and the other. So these are the precepts that you know that we will refrain from killing and harming uh, living beings, that we will refrain from uh, stealing, from taking what's not given. We will refrain from sexual misconduct. We will refrain from lying, uh, from not telling the truth. We will refrain from alcohol and drugs that cloud the uh, clarity of the mind. So these actually, to me, are the most important part of the Buddha's teaching in a way. They're the foundation for meditation, which is, in the West, people don't quite appreciate that. Often we come to meditation first, it's only after we meditate for a while we realise, yes, what I do, what I say, has an impact <laughs> when I sit down to meditate. So uh, this is very important, the ethical conduct. And then uh, the next quality, that the, the next most important thing, is what the Buddha called mental cultivation. In Pali language, bhavana. And this includes meditation, but it's everything. It includes developing, it's the most important aspect, is developing positive states of mind, reducing negative states of mind. And it can be related to when we're giving, developing more pulse, uh, positive states of mind, enjoying it, giving joy to giving. Uh, also developing our uh, ethical conduct so it's even better. We're more thoughtful and more kind. We can develop in a positive way as well. And the last aspect, just to abbreviate it, is wisdom. And this is a very important part of the essential part of the Buddha's teaching. And the heart of wisdom is actually knowing what's wholesome and what's not wholesome, what's positive and what's negative. People think this is really elementary. But I'm amazed if you read the newspapers, you see the internet. People don't know what's wholesome. They, they don't know what's uh, unwholesome. They're really confused. Uh, so this is a very important part of wisdom. And also the Buddha was uh, emphasizing right view. This is where we're coming from. The most important aspects of that are that the Buddha said there is rebirth. We have to find out. We can find out for ourselves about that. That there is re uh, karma. This is our actions have effects. So if we do positive actions, we have positive results. If we do negative actions of body and speech, we have negative results. And this leads to rebirth in different states. And also a very important part of right view is the fact that there are awakened teachers. There are enlightened teachers like the Buddha. So this is a very, very uh, essential part of the Buddha's teaching. And the, the Buddha says in those verses, he says, that when we see what is not essential as essential and assent what, when we see things that are essential as not essential, we're dwelling in, wrong, uh, in such fields of wrong thought. And this usually means that when, when we are trying to get all those things in those worldly conditions, we're trying to get all the sense pleasures, trying to get gain and get and gain, we're trying to get known and appreciated, 